What brings you out here today? I am out here because I don't have enough money to make a difference in this world. And that's frustrating. Frustrating that a corporation, a person like me, has all the rights as somebody who actually exists. That's nonsense. What's your sign say? Just keep American dreaming. And do you believe in the American dream? Uh, not, not so much. Not so much. I, I understand the value behind it and maybe what initially went for, but I think it's long lost that ability when it's everything stacked up against you. I mean, ask a student with mounds of debt and no job opportunities. That American dream is pretty far away at that point, you know. Some say the American dream is based on domination. What do you think of that? I think that's, that is very true. I think we're doing a pretty damn good job of it. I think collectively we run shit. Well, maybe not we, <laughs> but as an America, we definitely run shit. We can't survive. We need your help. Get rid of environmental regulations. Get rid of labor unions. The federal government has played, again, a vital role in all that. The New Deal, which is considered the height of American reform, was actually intended to rescue capitalism. <coughs> At that point, there was a real fear that fascism, which is another form of capitalism, or communism, which is the opposite of capitalism, would take root in the United States. Franklin Roosevelt had to regulate the system to save it. His predecessor, Herbert Hoover, who was a dyed-in-the-wool capitalist, had one of my favorite quotes. He said, the problem with capitalism is the capitalists. They're too goddamn greedy. <laughs> and so Hoover understood, you got to regulate these people, not because they're too powerful or they're oppressing people or cheating or lying or stealing. You have to regulate them because they'll screw themselves over, which is what we're seeing today, because there's no regulation. The banks have called the tune all along. Today, let me just sum up a few things. Today, we're talking about Wall Street, but there's another area we need to talk about. We know about Goldman Sachs, we know about Citibank, we know what's going on, Lehman Brothers, AIG, but don't forget, there is also in the United States, courtesy of the federal government, a vast and growing military industrial complex. And too often, we're not hearing about that. Last year, the CEO of Lockheed Martin made $21.89 million. The CEO of Northrop Grumman made $22.84 million. The CEO of Boeing made $19.4 million. Since 91101, 10 years ago, the federal government has spent $7.6 trillion, trillion with a TR, on war or terror related activities. Wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and inventions in Libya and a lot of other places, homeland security, uh, and if you want to include the Bush tax cuts in that, it's through the roof. Again, the federal government has played this role. The military, of course it is. The military then has as its main purpose to protect commerce. The military's role isn't to humanitarian. They're not going into Libya to save the Libyans from Gaddafi. Because two years from now, you'll see that the new thugs are no different than the old thugs. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. They are there to protect, in this case, American oil interests. Within that context, one of my favorite quotes of all time. Has anybody heard of General Smedley Butler? Yeah. A Wars Marine a General. A yeah. Smedley Butler said, I helped, and he was a Marine General, I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba decent for the National Citibank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefits of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909-1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. In China, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. I could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket on three districts. I operated on three continents. Clearly then, the military existed in order to promote these interests. Woodrow Wilson said that the key purpose for American statescraft was the extension of American commerce. 
and American military forces had to protect America's commercial interests. And he said, even if the sovereignty of independent nations be outraged in the process, a very explicit and candid explication. We don't really care about other countries' independence or self-determination or sovereignty. What's important is our ability to invest, to trade, to get markets, to get cheap labor, to get resources. All right, I'm gonna finish with the words of William Jennings Bryan. You, you all heard of the populace? Probably the greatest challenge to capitalism in U.S. history. They actually wanted a, uh, a, a, bank, a government uh, established bank for farmers a bank for farmers, not just for financiers. They wanted government nationalization of the railroads. Okay? Of course, they didn't get it. The standard bearer for the populace was William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan was making a speech, and he said, on the one side stand the corporate interests of the United States, the moneyed interests, aggregated wealth and capital, imperious, arrogant, and compassionless. On the other side, stand an unnumbered throng. Well, today we have a number, it's 99%. 1% of this society is as wealthy as the rest of us. And that means we have to come together as that 99% as a class. We have more in common with each other than we do with rich folks. Black people and white people have far more in common with each other than they do with rich people. Gay and street people have far more in common with each other than they do with rich people. Third world and first world people have more in common with each other than they do with rich people. Northerners and Southerners have more in common with each other than they do with rich people. Veterans and civilians have more in common with each other. Urban and rural, male and female, we all have more in common with each other than we do with Goldman Sachs, Citibank, and the Congress that they bought and paid for on Capitol Hill. Thanks. Thank you. Mussolini, uh, who was the dictator of Italy, uh, was quoted by the late journalist Molly Ivins of the New York Times yeah, as Molly. having said that fascism is the merger of corporation and state. He said that. Now, uh, I don't want to offend any Italian Americans here. <laughs> <laughs> but I will also go one further than uh, Molly did. I will say that Mr. Berlusconi of Italy, the Prime Minister of Italy, Mr. Berlusconi, who kind of has a bald spot, he doesn't quite look like Mussolini, nobody's that ugly, uh, but, but uh, Mr. Berlusconi owns the Italian news, media, and entertainment culture industry. He owns it. And, and he, controls the parliament. And, and he controls the parliament. Now, that takes Mussolini one step further. Merger of corporation, merger of state, and merger of the news, media, and culture industry. I mean, he's got more power now with four or five votes in the Italian Parliament than Mussolini ever had. And he ha Berlusconi has had that. I, I assert that the same kind of thing goes on now, has been going on, is going on, and that we all sense there's something wrong here. We may not have the skill set or the toolkit to really understand yet. But we know something is wrong. And what, what I would say is that what, what the Wall Street capitalists learned uh, from the Roaring Twenties and from uh, the New Deal, and what they learned from the Gilded Age was, don't take all their money in 10 years. Don't take all their money in 10 years. Instead, starting in 1981, I assert that we have had a creepy, creeping cartel capitalist coup d'etat. It's fascist. 
and that means and that means that Wall Street has made a to use a a Wall Street term has made a hostile takeover a hostile takeover of the federal of the state and even of this city government and the county government and government at all levels a hostile takeover a hostile takeover by Wall Street cartel capitalists. No, central bank fascism. Well, I think the, the Federal Reserve is probably one of their instruments uh, that they use to uh, oppress us, but it, but it would be catastrophic to get rid of the Fed and to, and to, and to uh, not keep our focus on where the problem is. The problem, the problem is. How was it before central banking existed? It was unregulated. Yeah. Banks could issue their own notes. They could issue their own bonds. You, you generally, you had periodic panics because banks would simply issue paper that it wasn't backed up, and so you had you'd have these runs and banks wouldn't have money to pay off investors. So you just, it was unregulated with kind of ebb and flow. The, the full faith and credit of the United States government. <laughs> uh, that means you. A hope and a prayer. No, it's, I mean, it's backed up with currency. It's, ba it's backed up with, with uh, you know, it's essentially the U.S. is its own collateral. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the Fed's solvent. I mean, it's just... It is. It, it works for for Wall Street. It works for Wall Street. That's what it's supposed to do. That is an excellent question. What is all this economic crisis about? What is this financial crisis? Can we still live? It, it, can, can we still live? You know, uh, in 2007 and 2008, and until last year, I really did not understand what the collapse of the financial industry was all about. I didn't take the time to research it on the web. I didn't go read books. Just read the business section and the newspaper. You know, watched uh, somebody on TV. And last year, I decided I'm going to understand this. It's better taking a blind eye. Oh, right. It, right. And and so I went and spent about an, an hour at Barnes and Noble or Book People or someplace, and I found a book called. Hoodwinked, H-O-O-D-W-I-N-K. How many of you have know of it or have read it? This book tells you, as they used to say in rural Ohio, how the cow ate the cabbage. This book tells you, you don't need to know statistics, you don't need to know monetary theory, you, you do need to know what a bribe is, you, you do need to know what hush money is. You do not need. You do need to know what debt is, and you're going to learn a whole lot of other things. But what I want want to talk about is not only to recommend that book among others as something to explain what the hell happened to us in 2007 and 2008. What was that all about? Well, I want to say some words to you and see if you have ever heard these words. First of all, Washington consensus. Has anybody heard that term, Washington consensus? Cut, 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 the social safety net. Have you, have you heard those words before? Cut, 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 where have we heard that? We've heard that right here. The Washington consensus has come home from Ecuador and from Angola uh, and from Indonesia, and it's come home to America, to the United States. Excellent point. There are, this is five trillion, as Dr. Brzezinski said, TR, five trillion dollars of the Social Security Trust Fund that was borrowed. There's an IOU, that $5 trillion isn't there anymore. There's an IOU from the United States government. What was it used for? To pay for the Iraq war. 
which I call Iraqi Vietnam, and I also call the other one Afghani Vietnam, because I don't think any of the economic, political, or military elites learned anything at all from what I call Vietnamistan. <laughs> Vietnamistan. The first Afghan war, the first Iraq war, this Libya, whatever, Syria, here and there, what they learned was what they learned in the Gilded Age and in the 1920s. Do it slowly or scare the hell out of everybody. Capitalism is a gun, right? It's the man with the gun, right, that makes it bad work. It ain't the gun, all right? And it's the same thing with, uh, with the Fed, right? It ain't the Fed, it's the people controlling the Fed. All right? So it ain't the Fed, it ain't capitalism, it ain't none of that. It's the people behind it. Is it not true that back in the 60s and 70s, the retirement age was 62? It is true. You could uh, you could retire early at 62. In fact, my father did, but then they... You didn't get full benefits, right? Yeah, and get full benefits. You but, could? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, but they changed yeah. the full benefit thing. Right, right. And so now, for instance, uh, uh, if, if you're 62, you can still retire and get Social Security and Medicare, but you're not going to get, uh, but maybe half of it. Right now it's 65, but I heard this year they were trying to raise it up to 67. That's, that's been floated, yeah. That idea's been floated. Okay, so that's basically the government saying, oh, geez, we st basically stole all this money. Let's hope that the people die before this age. I think so. There's, there's a book I'd recommend. Uh, I saw this woman on John Stewart last week. It's called The Retirement Heist. Right. <laughs> and it's about uh, not just Social Security, but private pensions, um, which are just getting ripped off by these corporations. Absolutely. There's enough money in private pensions to cover pretty much all the employees already. Uh, but they keep talking about all the money they paid out. They're paying out the CEOs. Yeah. So the yeah. pensions are kind of like everything else. It's one in 99%. Regular workers are getting, you know, these pensions are being taken away from regular workers and being used for these golden parachutes to pay off these guys, you know, they, they retire and get $450 billion, million dollars, that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, your, you know, your pension plans, whether private or public, are being ripped off, absolutely. That's, what I yeah. that's why they wanted to privatize them all Can in 401k. If they, if they privatize that, the market dropped half half its value. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's, everybody's pension would, would have lost 50% if they had privatized. Let alone if they privatized Social Security. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. If they privatized Social Security, uh -huh. yeah. we would have lost 50% of our pensions because right. the market yeah. went down by half in, in 08 and 09. I assert that the federal government all the state governments and the local governments, including this one, have been the victim, we have been the victim, of hostile takeover by cartel capitalism on Wall Street. My father worked 33 years for United Airlines and retired at age 60, which is an FAA requirement. And then the PBGC decided that since he retired at 60 and not 65, which was our national um, uh, thing after 9-11 uh, after happened and the airline industry was in a tremendous amount of trouble, that he was not entitled to his full pension. He lost 84% of his pension that he worked 33 years for. See, they, they do it just a little bit at a time since 1981. You know, you'll notice, or he will notice in your family, but I won't notice in mine. But then now I'm hearing your story. And so I know about that, and we know about that story. And, and I promise you, this has been a creeping, creepy, step-by-step -step coup d'etat against the 99% against the federal, state, and local government by Wall Street. But what do you We've mean got... when you say hostile? I mean, I don't see the guns out. I think people were just sheep. They just let it happen. Well, we, we could talk about that, but but um, I think there's probably, and there are probably some other uh, theories that could explain human behavior on that. But let me just point out, I've seen pepper spray. I've seen mace. I've seen batons. The response has been hot. They've been hostile to the response, but the takeover itself was just dominoes falling, right? It, well, that's 
I don't know if it was Domino's fault. I mean, the, like, I, I, I think like you I, said, it was set up that way. Well, it was set up that way. I mean, I think yeah. it's it's hostile in the sense that these businesses had no interest in their workers or in their retirees. I mean, I think it was done callously and coldly, you right. know, which is you know pretty hostile when because you do it that way. Because they have no conscience. No, they have exactly. No, he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, they're 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 only incentive. I mean, businesses. Uh, Starbucks doesn't care if you buy a Starbucks in Austin or in Ho Chi Minh City, <laughs> just so somebody buys a Starbucks. So creating jobs for people isn't their priority. Their priority is simply to get the cheapest labor possible and to, you know, to exploit people as, as much as possible, much like the slave system or the, the wage labor system. So, I mean, it, it, it's a hostile system. You know, the, the idea that, you know, we just let it go, I mean, uh, this is done behind closed doors. It's done in bills that are 800 pages long that nobody reads before they sign or vote for. Or so, vote for. Yeah. Well, besides me not getting my question, question answered about uh, what happens when, oh, you know, well, the calamity yeah. and all that, I'm wondering what we're talking about now, Mike. What does that have to do with Walmart uh, teaching their employees how to get food stamps right, and right. how to use the... Well, uh, I mean, wouldn't everybody think you, hear that? What does this what what does this have to do with Walmart teaching its employees to get food stamps and free health care and that kind of stuff? Did um your your first question was what what risk do we have if the banking system collapsed? Was that it? Yeah, the All right, I mean the the problem there, which you you actually was it was a pretty close thing in 08. Um, the the major problem here is companies don't have a vault full of money to pay their employees with. They actually take loans out. It's called commercial paper. It's kind of like a, a payday loan, these, these loan chart companies that exist. So um, the, 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 the global credit system was so crunched that there was a, a vast shortage of commercial paper. I mean, companies like GE and GM were literally getting loans that day as they cut their checks to their workers and their, and their uh, vendors and things like that. That's the crisis. If the system really were to collapse, then commercial paper would be unavailable, which means people would get paid. Which means they'd be out of work. That's that's the. I mean, as much as we hate, you know, the stock market and everything else, the stock market collapse. I mean, it's not. It's nice to say, oh, you know, it's, they get what they deserve. But average people will be the ones who get get screwed. You know. But that's that's the real crisis. It's the availability of credit. This is a global system built on debt and credit. You're born with a certain amount of debt. It's just assumed. The only way to get even is just to like, you know, in your final years, run up your credit cards and, and <laughs> stick Visa with the bill. You know? And then your smile. descendants pay for that. Yeah, right. But uh, um, it's, a, it's a system based on, it's, it's called a, uh, Marx and others called it a rentier state. A rentier state doesn't exist based on manufacturing or production. A rentier state exists based on credits, on rents, on dividends, not on anything produced. Once you cease producing and becoming a producer country, which the U.S. did around the 70s, then you become a, 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 a debt country, a rentier state. And when you do that, you, you run into the kinds of problems. We've had stagnant wages since 1970. I grew up in Ohio, too, Youngstown, <laughs> Youngstown area. Yeah, I'm from Youngstown. You're kidding. You know Louis Wolf? No, but <laughs> no, I mean he's he been on neighbor. the radio. He's an activist. Though. Okay, um, but you know, in Youngstown, you could work in the mills. A, a blue-collar worker would make enough money to have a house, buy a house, buy a car, send the kids to college, go to vacation. Right? Since 1970, that's impossible. You now have husbands and wives working, so you have men and wife, men and women working, which you didn't have really that much before 1970, and wages have been stuck. Uh, Keynes called it sticky wages, right? And 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 I'm not I'm not much of a Keynesian. I'm actually more more attracted to, to Marx's ideas on economics. But Keynes's basic idea was you had to to put money in circulation. If wage you had sticky wages, so you put money. That's if the Fed wanted to do something productive, and this is a horrible solution. But short of raising taxes on rich people, which Obama ain't going to do because he's a Republican, basically. Um, the only thing you really could do is keep printing, the, keep running the printing presses, and that what they call quantitative easing. And that really, at this point, the, the 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 only solution you need people to buy stuff. I mean, economics can very easily be explained. And do you have enough money to buy the shit you need? You know, can you afford to buy rent? Can you afford to buy healthcare? Can you afford to buy a car, transportation, whatever, food? Can you get your car at a good pound? That's part of it. You know. And so, I, with sticky wages, which means we've seen wages stagnate over the last, really, 
two generations, then without some kind of impetus, you're going to see, I mean, Youngstown, if any of you are familiar with Ohio, Youngstown was a very wealthy place. It was the one of the steel capitals, like Gary, Indiana, like Pittsburgh. Uh, incredible wealth, a uh, population of 160,000. It's down to 70,000. It's a ghost town. Factories the skies used to, were red. The skies were red and full of soot when the wind blew. And now it's just yeah. desolate. And so those are, I mean, a lot of those people came to Texas because what you saw in the 70s was an abandonment of northern manufacturing to places where there were not unions. And Texas is hostile. The South is hostile to unions. The best program to enter the middle class was and still is joining a union. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, only 7% of private sector employees today are unionized. About a third of public employees are unionized. Only 7%, right? Throughout American history, union work has always been better paid, better protected, better benefits, right? This, this decline that, that he's mentioned coincides exactly with the decline of unions, the decline mm -hmm. of, of union yes. labor. Uh, there was a point at which about a third of the workforce, about 30% was unionized, now it's 7%. They uh, uh, decided that after World War I, the greatest threat would be uh, communism. And what have we been scared of since 1917, and really until now? I mean, people are running for president of the United States now and saying they're a commie pinkos. The Obama of all things, I agree with you. I, he is not a socialist. He may be a lot of things, but he ain't no socialist. He's no critical theorist, and I don't think he's an Adam Smith capitalist either. And and the, uh, and the other problem is why are the Republicans? This is why I, I want you to ask yourself why. Why is this? How has it come to be that every single Republican in the United States Senate votes to filibuster just about every single thing that Mr. Obama sends up to Congress? How has that happened? And, and, and an even more important question, uh, as a former Democrat, how has it happened that there are only 95 of the Democrats in the House and only 33 of the Democrats in the Senate who consistently vote against cutting Social Security, against cutting Medicare, against cutting Medicaid, against cutting Pell Grants, against cutting the Environmental Protection Agency funding. Why are there only 33? We've got 54 in the Senate. Why only 95 in the House? I, we've got twice that number and plus uh, Congressperson Giffords. How has that happened? Well, two words. Campaign Finance. contributions. Yes. Campaign contributions. They don't bribe them anymore like they did in Daniel Webster's day. Yeah, it's illegal now. But what they do do is they have made it so costly for anyone to run for office. Primarily because what's the primary medium used? Television. In television. And is that television time free? Oh, so uh, General Electric or Disney or somebody that owns the networks <coughs> sells commercials during the ABC News and the NBC News and CNN News or whatever. On the frequencies provided by the government. By, right. On the frequencies provided by the 99%. Yeah. Yeah. And they just take it to the bank, literally. That's why one of the things I think we could think about is why not uh, offer free television time, free internet, free internet. For, you, you know, you, you, read, you do it on the internet. You got your own channel. That yeah, why don't we goes own to it. Fuck yeah. yeah, and that's that that's would be, an, be that would be an authentic. Get rid of all this other kind of bullshit you got to pay for. Tell them everybody gets you Republicans, you Democrats, all your candidates line up, get your own website, and that's all you get, and you can't have any other money.
Yes. Well, that's an interesting idea, but uh, that would up. be something that I, I I would consider authentic Adam Smith capitalism. Well, uh, real. The, the problem is <laughs> the people who would have to decide that are the people who are already in power, so they would basically right. be voting yes. to get rid right. of themselves. So, yeah. you know, we can vote yeah. for the guys that do it. Public financing of elections is the only thing that's going to change that system. Well, they, people they're, own the elections, and they have machines that tell them and prove the way they voted. Yeah. Then they're never going to be able to change the system by voting. Well, uh, there is a guy uh, who has been on TV on MSNBC, and he's going to be on current TV right after Keith Olbermann, and his name is Chank C E N K Uger U Y G. E R, I think. Chank Uger. Huh? Is it? You think it's A R? Chank Uger. I stand corrected or something. Look it up. But anyway, he's with the Young Turks website online, and he has a newscast every day, and he's going to have one on Current TV uh, in a couple of weeks. But he has proposed what he calls the Twenty Eighth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And he announced this at Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park, which I like to call Liberty Square. And the first thing it says in this proposed 28th Money Amendment is... Money does not buy is, free speech. Huh? Money does not buy free speech. Money does not buy free speech. Well, I agree. What, what, what he... The first thing in this proposed 28th Amendment is corporations are not people. Corporations are not people. That's the first sentence in the 28th Amendment. And in this proposed 28th Amendment, it says that no one, not me, not the Koch brothers, not Donald Trump, not Bill Gates, not even the saintly Warren Buffett, can give any single candidate more than one hundred dollars in any campaign. Well, we had a limit of twenty-five hundred dollars, and we actually still have that uh, limit. Uh, but to, to to get take on on the point you raise, free speech means free. You're not supposed to have to pay for it. However, the five vote majority on the United States Supreme Court is not the same by five votes that stole the 2000 election, not from Al Gore, but from us. They stole it from us. Al Gore was a bit player. But they stole it from us. It's not that it's it's five votes, but it's not the same five votes. This five-vote majority on the Supreme Court issued a ruling called Citizens United, which was a conservative, capitalist, right-wing group who wanted to appear mainstream. So they called themselves Citizens United. Well, this ruling does two things. First of all, it allows Donald Trump and the Koch brothers and Bill Gates and, and all the top 400 or 500 of the wealthy to make unlimited, unlimited, unlimited campaign contributions to what they call super political action committees. Super PACs. Not only can they make unlimited contributions, they can make them anonymously. They don't have to be disclosed to us. That's what the Supreme Court said, basically saying if you got the bucks, uh, you can uh, campaign uh, with unlimited anonymous contributions from the hundred thousandaires and the millionaires and the billionaires. 
How many of them were appointed by Bush? Well, uh, at least one, three. Well, the first Bush appointed at least one of them. That was Clarence Thomas. Right. Uh, and I believe one of them was was appointed by President Reagan. Scalia. Oh, Scalia, yes, Scalia. Uh, oh, talk about a wicked... <laughs> Jesus used the word stiff-necked. You stiff-necked people, you don't have compassion on your fellow person. Well, I like that those words, stiff-necked. If there's anybody stiff-necked on the Supreme Court, it's Antonin Scalia. There's always been a gap in U.S. history. There's never been a disparity this huge where it's really kind of one or two percent versus the other 98 or 99. You know, I mean, we're not going to turn socialist. We're not going to have public ownership or anything like that anytime soon. Uh, you know, so I'm, that's that's a fantasy. That's 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 unicorn shit and rainbows, you know. Um, in the short term, better wages, uh, tough, a, a more equitable tax system. Board governance yeah, reform. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if we had simply... Uh, let the Bush tax cuts elapse, that would, I forget how many trillions that would have, you know, saved us. So just, uh, I mean, if, you know, it's kind of funny. I've seen recently some YouTube videos of Reagan talking about the need for the rich to pay taxes. Um, Reagan, uh, Richard Nixon would be a, a, a raging liberal today. Uh, no, I'm serious. Yes, Richard sir. Nixon would be a raging liberal today. He would have no place in American politics. Reagan, frighteningly enough, sounds sensible compared to these guys. But I mean, in the short term, you know, you're going to have this, I mean, this government corporate nexus and our friend's gone, but um, you know, he kept saying that's fascism, that's fascism. Fascism has two components to it. One is that a very authoritarian political system, which you had in, 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 uh, in Germany and, and in Italy, where they literally crushed and killed, you know, labor unionists and socialists and people like that. And, but the other part is that kind of corporate, corporate and, and, and government nexus. And that's, that's fascism. You know, in the in the 30s, when Hitler emerged, the only government that opposed him was Stalin's. And the West felt fairly comfortable with Hitler because communism, as you point out, was the enemy. They, fascism was a derivative of capitalism. It wasn't that different. And in fact, when Franklin Roosevelt began the New Deal, Herbert Hoover, his predecessor's first complaint was, the National Recovery Administration is fascist because it was the state regulating or working with these corporations, this, this nexus. So Hoover's calling Roosevelt a fascist. So it's not that extreme. But you know what, you know, what do you do to fix it? I mean, in the short term, uh, you, you band-aid it. Better wages, more unions. What are the tricks of capitalism? But we have a, I was just gonna say, even Ronald Reagan said, communism will not be defeated, it'll be transcended. And, you know, this is like the big crunch, big shift. I mean, it is a paradigm. And, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, well, we lived, a bunch of us here lived through the 89, 91, the, the fall of communism. What we're seeing in the last few years in the capitalist world is, is actually more grave. And yet we're not hearing about the fall of capitalism, right? I mean, what you're seeing now, if you believe in, well, I mean, you're right, this is not Adams with capitalism. Uh, but what you're seeing now is, is essentially state socialism on behalf of, of bankers. You're seeing it in Europe. Uh, they bailed out Greece or today. Uh, near yesterday or whatever. I mean, so you're right. I mean, it, it's. I would like to say that we do have an alternative, and that's right here with Occupy Austin. I mean, pretty much is developing into a collective. I mean, we've got the free food centers down there. We're trying to get working groups started and take people out to farms. And that's what I mean by public, public institutions and public public entities. We've abandoned that in this country. I mean, we've kind of that that social contract is gone, and it was always kind of tenuous. But now, there's no sense that we have meaning as as a public, as people as a community. No, I agree, totally. I mean, I believe in things like collectives and co-ops and things like that. That's just damn hard in a country of 300 million people to organize. And if there was a collapse, isn't that what would be the result? It might. I mean, you or know, either, you know. <laughs> I'm just, I said, I, said I, I yeah. think a collapse is probably what would finally prompt that, you know, sadly, I, I don't know. I was just, at the Randalls down on Lake Austin Boulevard before I came here, and I saw a sign advertising something. Buy two, get two free. Now, were they apples? How many of you think they were apples? Were they cantaloupes? How many of you think, was it a head of lettuce? 
it was Doritos. Doritos. It's not a nutritious snack. And they are, and the Dorito company and the Randall's company is saying, come into Randall's and we'll give you two for free if you'll buy two. Now, when do you pay for all those four Doritos? You know, when you're in your 60s or 70s or you get cancer, you start getting uh, plaque built up in your arteries or whatever, that, that's the payback. And, and the, the, uh, the problem with the, the, the cartel capitalism that we have now is that all of the costs, they keep talking about the bottom line. Have you heard that? The bottom line, profit or loss? Well, guess uh, here just like with the news media, what they don't tell you is far more important than what they do tell you. The bottom line does not include cleaning up toxic waste dumps or, or uh, pollution, water pollution, air pollution. Uh, it doesn't include any of that. And I, they, they talk a lot about cost of doing business cost of doing business, in my judgment, this is just my opinion, but I consider eliminating, for instance, lead pollution from coal plants to be a cost of doing business. It should be. Why isn't it? This is a question I ask to capitalists. Why is it not a cost of doing business? Why do they want to keep getting out from under the Environmental Protection Agency regulations, which are pretty weak now, and even Obama uh, chose not to implement the new, new smog regulations, even though there's new science. Uh, you know, what up with that? Distress their value on the stock market? Well, I think so. Um, one of the tricks of capitalism and I want you to think about this in your own experiences. Not a book, not a magazine, in your own experiences. How many of you get pop-up ads on the internet? How many of you see television ads on TV? Or radio ads on the radio? Or newspaper ads? How many of you get email marketing? Email marketing. You see these? These are supposedly discount coupons or cards. Now, I don't know if this is theoretically correct according to anybody's economics, but I consider these to be currency. Currency. Basically, the banks and, you know, Office Depot or Petco or, you know, Express Lube, whatever they are, are issuing currency which is what the banks did before the Fed. And so I, my question is, why, are, why is our government permitting this currency? The second thing is, why do these companies think it is their constitutional right to get your name, your address, your phone number in order for them to market to you? Because you know what? I can tell you how, maybe 10 bucks worth of discounts out of all these cards. But you know how many emails I have received from these cards? It's marketing, it's advertising. And this is the trick of capitalism. They want to make you buy stuff you don't need. Stuff you don't need with money you don't have. With money you don't have. And if, if four Dorito bags, buy two, get two free, if that doesn't fit that definition, I don't know what does. You see that, that kind of erupt in the, in the 1960s. Prior to that time, very few people had credit cards, or, and credit was very difficult to come by. Uh, uh, credit was essentially given to people who were fairly well off. Getting a house, no car, no, that was even difficult. 
and yeah, you had to have collateral. And so in the in the sixties, um, what you needed was a mass increase in, in consumption. And the way to do that is to either put money into people's hands, which you generally won't do because that's considered socialism. <laughs> if you create jobs, I mean, you can build a bomber, you can build a tank, that's national security. But if you build a school or a hospital, that's socialism, yeah. right? Um, so they had to find another way to do that. And, and what you have is this massive expansion uh, of, of private credit in the 60s and especially in the 70s. The first thing that happens is the states essentially do away with usury laws, which cap the amount of interest you could charge. So interest rates go from six, seven percent, literally overnight, to the 20, sometimes even 30 percent range. Uh, especially credit cards, like in the late 70s, massive inflation. Um, so the what you shark right out of business? Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> and this also coincides. This also coincides with the return and the and the uh, 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 legalization of, of gambling in, in the form of lotteries. You pay for education via the lottery. I mean, I remember in Youngstown, you played the bug. You, I'm sure you know. Remember, you throw a nickel or dime down, you play the bug, right? Yep. And. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, so you have this massive expansion of credit. And the, the purpose of it is to get people to buy stuff they don't need. Because the economy, the, the inexorable rule of capitalism is continued growth. If capitalism quits growing, it dies. So once people, you know, the, the first stage of capitalism is producers' capitalism. You, you built factories and you built machines and you built railroads. That's not stuff that you would buy on your own. That's not a consumer item. You don't buy your own factory, you don't buy your own railroad. The next phase in the 20s is consumer capitalism, where you like create canned goods and automobiles, uh, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, things like that, Process can food. openers, hmm? Process processed foods. foods, things like that that a consumer will buy. Well, by the 50s and 60s, you have this massive growth of the economy post-World War II. And in the post-World War II era, the U.S. controls 50% of the world's trade. There's a prescient man, George Cannon, have you ever heard of George Cannon? diplomat, one of, one of the, the very honest and candid, one of the most candid statements in 1948, Kennan said, we have 6% of the world's population, but control 50% of the world's wealth. Our task in the coming years is to, vise, is to devise a pattern of relationships to maintain this position of disparity. He didn't say, our task is to feed the world, our task is to create equality, our task is to give housing to the homeless to create better opportunity. He didn't say anything. Our task in the coming world is to maintain this position of disparity where 6% we control 50% of the wealth. So there's this massive wealth and you can't keep that going unless people buy more and more things. One of the keys in, in fact to civil rights was to create and develop the South and create a consumer class out of African Americans. That's 20 to 25 million people who aren't buying stuff at Sears and AMP and Fazio's and places like that. So credit becomes the key force in this transition to a new era of consumption. You make these credit cards available to average people, not just the people who are fairly well off. And with this comes this massive expansion of private debt. Private debt exceeds public debt. Everyone in America has the equivalent of about eighty thousand dollars in private debt at birth. So, uh, can you talk about how planned obsolescence fits into all that? Yeah, and planned obsolescence is part of it, right? You build things that, that purposely aren't going to last as long as you want them to, or that will be outdated. I mean, well, Windows, whatever, Windows Seven, or you know, Windows NT, Windows XP, this, that. Um, you purposely build stuff that will, you know, the, what are they on? The iPhone 5 now or something like that? Will be 4? Yes. Yeah. It's 4 now? <laughs> 4S. Oh, 4, okay. I mean, but you purposely build stuff. Now, that's the beauty of the military industrial complex. Not only do you have planned obsolescence, but once you fire a bullet, you can't use it again. Once you shoot down, you know, get an airplane shot down, you can't fly it again. You know, so. Um, but that's crucial. Yeah, if they made good, I mean, you know, you could easily make a car that would last 20, 25 years. Um, but if you did that, then you wouldn't keep selling. So you do that, and then advertising is crucial to this too. The amount Isn't of money spent. What's that? Oh Isn't yeah, it? you have to get the new. You know, I mean, look, cigarette adver The history of cigarette advertising is fascinating. Not that many people smoked in the early part of the 20th century, and whoever was brilliant came up with the idea of putting pictures of naked girls in in cigarette cartons. So young men 
started buying cigarettes to get these pictures of naked girls and then smoke the cigarettes and they're hooked because in every other week there would be like a new a new girl on it like a playboy model or something like that and so advertising is is brilliant at this too it it convinces people you need stuff you don't need and then that's, credit yeah. that's what you're saying and yeah. then it's like I, the emails we get yes yeah. all this stuff yeah. uh, that's just unbelievable that's what i call the drug dealer business well, model and, and it is uh, i mean until last year the, the laws changed on campus at UH, where I teach, they would have these tables where they would give a kid a t-shirt and have them sign up for a credit card. 18 year old. That's what dealers do. You get your first hit for free, or the first couple hits for then you're hooked. And that's what they do. These kids, these kids credit cards with a $500 limit, which they max out immediately. Then they raise it to a thousand. Yeah, yeah. So now, didn't this expansion of capital compensate for the stagnant wages? That's that exactly what it did, yeah. Instead of paying people more wages, you made more credit available. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, it, and, and who did that benefit? The banks, which, which issued the credit cards. And corporations. And corporations, yeah. With the first few colonies, uh, somebody came up with this uh, brilliant uh, marketing uh, idea or strategy to say that cleanliness is next to godliness, right? And I, from what I hear, that was the first soap sales we did on uh, if you see the original ads, yes. um, they do uh -huh. that. They also, um, very early on, uh, uh, the whole idea of sex is, is ever, you know, as soon as you see advertising. That you know. changed our whole culture. We became the cleanest culture yeah. in the world. Yeah. But, you know, they also have these ads where, um, you know, they'll have a woman in distress because she can't get a man and, unless she uses palm olive soap or something yeah. like that. Did you see the uh, history through the cigarettes and women's rights movements to vote? And the cigarette companies got on in that and called them Liberty Torches. And they, you know, put them here and then so that just... I'm going to switch the uh, marijuana cigarette. That's the new Liberty Torch. I'm going to use that hat. I to add to uh, uh, what was just said about the, the cigarette smoking. My father was at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 and served the year before and through the rest of the war. One of the things he told me is that the... the companies that manufacture cigarettes handed out free packs of cigarettes to the uh, soldiers and, and Navy and, and people in the Pacific. Now, I have to assume that the same thing happened in Europe, but I don't know yeah, that. It did, it did. After they were already traumatized. Yep. Uh-huh. Very minimal cost, and the bulk of the cost is tax for well, military people. Uh, what's, what's happening now is the smoking rate has gone down so far because we have banned television advertising of tobacco. But guess where it's up? Yeah, they've increased the price here. But guess where the cost is recovered? Third world and fourth world, because th there's a show on current TV called Vanguard, and they have a documentary where their journalist is standing there and saying to the people gathered, there is a school, here is a cigarette stand, does anybody have a problem with it? They are setting up cigarette stands in Indonesia across the street from elementary and middle schools. Go ahead. I just uh, I just wanted to let everybody that's here know um, uh, my friend Curtis is passing around a uh, a list if anybody wants to talk about further economics and possibly solutions uh, all you need to do is sign up on that list. All I had to say. The, uh, the cigarette thing, let me add to that, because uh, you're all familiar with the opium wars. You know what the opium wars are? The British waged war against China because China tried to eradicate opium. A massive addiction problem. And so it's a public health campaign, which was succeeding. So the British waged war to force the Chinese to take in Indian opium that the British control. Well, this is what the, this is what the U.S. is doing. It's not just that tobacco companies are marketing in places like Indonesia. In fact, I think it was Indonesia, or I think it was Indonesia, had a public health campaign specifically directed to uh, lower the rate of smoking. In Indonesia, the United States threatened trade sanctions against Indonesia. If it limited 
or made it more difficult to sell U.S. cigarettes in, in Indonesia, then the U.S. would retaliate against Indonesian products coming to the U.S. It's the opium wars all over again. Right now, the biggest smoking country in the world is China. It's the biggest market for tobacco. About two-thirds of China smokes. Uh, they're going to have a massive lung cancer epidemic and horrible pollution problems. And, uh, you know, and, and that's why. The U.S. could take these hits, these court cases, and a reduction in smoking in the U.S. because it's a pittance compared to what they're making in the third world. Absolute pittance. On the opium wars, we're doing that in Afghanistan right now. Yeah. Instead of co-opting it and using it to make the drugs that we make that use opium, we're trying to eradicate it because it, it interferes with our business. What keeps the capitalists from turning on each other um, in creating products that will actually last and, and that would do consumers a favor? There are, I mean, that's generally how smaller companies get started. They make a better product. And the problem there is most of those better products cost more, so they're not, they don't have the same access to a mass market. You know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I like motorcycles. I have a Ducati and a Triumph. I mean, those things are going to last a long time, but I paid for them. You know, I could buy a, a Yamaha 650, you know, which isn't gonna. So, I, I mean, you can buy a product that's gonna last, but it's not gonna be mass market and it's gonna cost more. I mean, that's the problem right now with green, green sustainable products. Right. You can make a good product, yeah, and you can get it on the market and you can make a good profit off of it, but you're not gonna reach a mass market. If you're content with that, you can still do that. I made you know? more money in 1974 in the retail clerks than they pay people at Whole Foods today. I want to throw out a word that we've heard with the green economy, and that's sustainability. Sustainability. I'm kind of thinking that maybe democratic capitalism, where democracy rules cartel capitalism, but cartel capitalism does not rule democracy, may kind of look like a sustainable kind of market. I don't know. I haven't thought this through, and I'm going to have thousands of conversations and read books and stuff before, you know, I finally figure it out. But, but that's a word, sustained, sustainable. That is the big. That word. is an interesting word to me because the 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 cartel capitalists on Wall Street say they have a right to make a profit. They say that they have a right to increase shareholder value. They say they have a right to market to anybody and trick them by any means to get them to buy stuff they don't need with money they don't have. And I call that cartel capitalism. The word cartel is from a friend of mine. I used to call it nuclear meltdown capitalism. Now, I'm not in favor of nuclear power, but there are three things that can happen when you have a nuclear reaction. One is it can blow up. One is it can melt down, as happened in Fukushima, Japan. And the third thing is what the first nuclear reaction at the University of Chicago, uh, Enrico Fermi, I believe, uh, did uh, in, uh, the late 30s or early 40s, he created a controlled nuclear reaction. And the way you control it, now see, they, they use funny words. They, they say, can we take this plant at Fukushima down to a cold shutdown? Well, what does cold mean? I'm cold right now. You know what a cold nuclear shutdown is? 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what they call a cold shutdown. Well, hell, I didn't know that when we voted on the nuclear power plant in 1984 times or whatever it was here. I, did, I knew there were cooling ponds that they put the uh, uranium rods in because they're 2,500 degrees. I didn't know that, but I knew they were hot and they had to cool. <laughs> But again, what they did not tell us is far more important than what they did. They did not tell us that there was a danger if water leaked out of the cooling ponds because that would expose the uranium pellets 
and they would it would have a nuclear reaction and it would melt down. Those are the two kind of meltdowns that Fukushima had. Fukushima had a meltdown of its nuclear power reactors. And Fukushima also had a meltdown in their cooling pools. Well, hell, I didn't know that cooling pools could melt down. But I, the third thing that I want to say about a nuclear reaction is when you do one like Fermi in the University of Chicago, which is where nuclear power supposedly comes from, they said it was going to be too cheap to meter in the early 50s. Oh, nuclear power is the answer for, for everything. Uh, we, it'll be free. But what Enrico Fermi, Fermi discovered is that you can control a nuclear reaction by inserting what are called control rods, basically carbon and stuff. You can make it uh, hotter by pulling them out. You can make it cooler in nuclear physicist terms by pushing them in. The reason I think cartel capitalism is nuclear meltdown capitalism is because democracy <laughs> should be the control rods. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. I heard him say the revolution won't be televised. Al Jazeera proved him wrong. Twitter has him paralyzed.